Hi, I'm Laura McCabe, and I'm here today to talk to you about bezeling Rivoli's. Okay, so bezeling Rivoli's, one of my favorite things to do. I do it in lots of my work. I have a couple of samples of it here where I've done them. Um, you can actually use this technique we're gonna talk about today um, for any stones, really, for any round stones, but it works great for Swarovski crystals. Uh, so we will take a minute to just talk a little bit about Rivoli's. I am gonna start by telling you about my book, which I wrote once upon a time in 2008. Um, but this is a book all about that. So if you're looking for more projects and that sort of thing, this is uh, Creating Crystal Jewelry with Swarovski. That's my book. So, um, But what we're going to be doing today is just the basic technique to bezel the stone. We're not going to get into these more elaborate projects. We're just going to do the bezel itself. What I've done for you, um, and it's in the show notes, is there is a link to a PDF here that I'll show you. And what it has in it is all the sort of basic instructions for how you're gonna do the bezeling. But I've also given you a nice little chart on the back which gives you the counts that you're gonna need. You're gonna see once we get into the demo that you're gonna need to know the counts for the different sizes of stones. And while you can calculate that, you can also refer to this easy quick reference chart. So we're going to get into that now. We're going to talk about um, not only the technique, but the tools and everything that you're going to need to do a little Rivoli bezeling. Okay, before we talk technique, let us take a minute just to talk about tools, because it's worth going over those first. Um, for bezeling Rivoli's, there's a few things you're going to need. Uh, first things first, you're going to need your thread. I use Fireline when I work with anything. All of my beadwork I do with Fireline, and generally it's six pound test. Every once in a while I'll drop to four pound, but basically six pound is what I use for, um, for everything. And it comes in, um, you can get some colors out there, but primarily you're gonna find it in smoke or crystal. So depending on the colors of the beads that you're using, um, you'll pick accordingly if you want the darker or the lighter color. Um, now, one of the disadvantages with the smoke uh, that I'll tell you about is it is oiled. So it does have like an oil on it, which will get off on your hands. It also, um, you'll see it on your wax too sometimes. You'll get a little bit of a darkening there. Um, and the best way to handle that to reduce the amount of oil that's coming off of it is just run it through a paper towel or a tissue, and that'll kind of wipe off some of that excess oil be a little less messy when you work it with it. Um, a little tip I'll tell you, it was kind of exciting to discover this, um, is they also make, Berkeley makes Fireline Micro Ice, and that is actually intended for ice fishing, I believe, um, but the Micro Ice smoke has considerably less oil. I don't know why, but it has considerably less oil on it. So you can use that and you'll find it's even cleaner than the regular smoke. The thing um, to keep in mind though is this, you, the only place I've ever found it is on the Berkeley website itself. So I'll put that link in the show notes below if you guys are interested in the micro ice. It comes in different sizes just like the regular fire line. So again, I use the six pound on that one. Now, if you are not a fire line person, we are not all fire line people, it is fine to use a nylon thread. So there's a bunch of them out here. This is a Ceylon and this is 1G. They're both great ones to use. If you are using one of them that comes in various sizes, not all of them come in the different uh, sizes and different weights, but if you, they are, like Ceylon comes in, in A's and D's, you want the D weight, uh, the slightly thicker one. So. Um, keep that in mind when you're shopping for your thread. Um, the nice thing about nylon threads is that you do get a lot of color variety in those, so you can pick your colors accordingly and you have a lot more options there. You will need beading needles, and because of the bezeling technique that I use, I, I use very small beads, 15 0 Czech Charlottes, and when you work with those, you do need a size 13 needle, otherwise you're probably not going to be able to get through them. So. I would recommend a size 13. These are John James, and that's just what I've always used and what I like, but you can use any beading needle. It's just the only thing that's important is the size on that. Now, when it comes to your needles and thread, you're gonna need to cut your thread, and you'll need a good pair of scissors for that. If you're working with nylon thread, this sort of isn't relevant, but working with Fireline, it will really chew up 
your scissors when you cut it because it's you know it's kind of a it's kind of a thick and coarse uh, thread to be cutting. So you'll want to pick a pair of scissors that's not terribly expensive because you will go through them. But this is a great one that I would really recommend to you guys. It's Westcott Titanium. Um, they're not expensive at all. You can pick them up uh, usually at um, sort of office supply places like Staples would probably have them. But if you can't find them there, you can always get them online too. I will put a link in the show notes to the Amazon um, place where you can um, where you can buy them. So uh, worth trying, definitely. I really like those. And you may want, this is optional, I always use wax when I work. And I use microcrystalline wax, which is a synthetic wax. It's not beeswax. It's a man-made wax. It's quite sticky. Um, I like it because for a couple of reasons. I like it because it really helps to condition the thread and it minimizes the knots that you get when you're working. Um, knots are always an issue with beading. So it's great for that. The other thing it helps with a lot is your tension. It really will help you to maintain a consistent and um, sort of a moderate consistent tension. Um, if people have trouble with their tension, I often recommend trying this because it's a little bit sticky. So when you pull it through, it kind of holds things in place a little bit better. Now, one of the downsides to it is it does sort of, um, it is a lot stickier than beeswax and so it does kind of leave wax on the beads you'll find sometimes um, and that's what usually bothers people about it. A couple things uh, to do about that. One is to really make sure after you wax your thread that you scrape off any excess that's on there with your fingernails. Try to get as much off as you can um, and then it will still stick stick quite well but it will um, it won't clog up your beads as much. The other thing I can tell you, which I do, and it horrifies a lot of people, but I do it all the time with my work, and it's so far so good. Um, I do wash my work. I run it under like warm, not hot, but warm water very quickly, and I'll pat it dry with a paper towel. And because this wax in particular has a very low melting point, it'll just kind of wash right off so that you won't have a problem with it. Um, if you're going to do this, I do recommend you try it out on a small piece of beadwork before you go for washing your major pieces. The reason is sometimes people's well water or even city water can have sort of minerals in it that can cause issues with beads. I also always use permanent finish if I'm using galvanized, and that will make a difference too. A galvanized bead that isn't a permanent finish bead can give you trouble if you're washing it. So, um, but, but that's what I found is a good solution if you feel like there's a, a lot of wax on there. Um, if you are working with Rivoli's, which we're gonna do today, the, the thing with Rivoli's, with the, especially with the wax, is you get a lot of fingerprints on the Rivoli's. Um, oh, is an issue and um, kind of, it doesn't look great when you have all those fingerprints on it. The, the easiest solution to that is to take one of those microfiber cloths that you use for polishing or, you know, for cleaning your glasses. Um, those work great on Rivoli's too. So you can just use that once you're finished, use that on the surface of the Rivoli and it will take off any fingerprints or wax prints that you might have on there. So those are your basic tools. I'm also going to talk in a moment about materials before we get going, but it's nice to kind of go over everything before we get, get started. Okay, now let's talk about the materials, the fun sparkly stuff. So to do these rivolis, you're going to need, as far as seed beads go, you're going to need some Japanese cylinder beads, and you want to make sure they're size 11. These come in different sizes, and you'll find them um, made by different companies. Toho makes Treasures and Icos, and Miyuki makes Delicas, and any of those are going to work for you. You just want to make sure they are the size 11, because like I said, they do come in different sizes. You're also going to need size 15 round Japanese seed beads, and depending on what size stone you're, you're doing, you may need more or less if you want to change the color with each row, some of them take more rows, some of them less, depending on the size of the stone. So um, you'll need those, and you'll also need these size 15 Czech Charlottes. Now if you're not familiar with Czech Charlottes, they are super teeny tiny. Even though they're labeled a size 15, you'll notice they're significantly smaller than the 15 round Japanese beads. So there's quite a difference there in size. Um, that is generally the case with Czech beads. The same size number will be significantly smaller than the Japanese in that size. 
And of course, you must not forget the important part, which is the Rivolis. Um, these guys are great. They come in many different sizes. They're made by Swarovski. Um, and I love them. They're like, we'll look at them for a second here. They are like little spaceships. They're beautiful nice and sparkly and then if I put it on its side there you can kind of see it is quite a shallow stone uh, comes to a central point on both sides so yeah little spaceships and they come in like I said a whole variety of sizes um, right here I have this is going to be a size 18 a 16 a 14 and a 12 so you can use you know all different sizes depending on the size you're gonna use a different count of beads to start. So we'll talk about that in a moment. But this is what you wanna get lined up before you get going. Okay, so the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is you're gonna to wanna to thread up your needle. So we got our needle and our thread here. You wanna make sure you have a nice clean cut on the end of that, especially if it's fire line um, for threading up. And then if you are using fire line, it can use a little flattening and you can do that with your nails or you can even do that with a pair of pliers that works too and what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to needle my thread so I'm going to press down over the end there that's going to be what you want to do and I'm going to pull it through now we talked about waxing so we're going to wax the thread if you like like I said this is optional but I'm going to bring it in and now I work with a single thread. I just find for the most part that's easier. Occasionally if I'm doing like a lot of fringing, I'll use a double, but a single is much easier if you have to back out. So I use a single thread and what you're gonna do is pull it through here. You wanna be real gentle at first because the eye of that needle is very delicate. So don't pull too hard until you've cleared the eye through that. And then you can take it and you can really pull hard to get that through. There we go. And then like I said, you want to make sure that you get any of this excess wax off. So scrape it, get a little bit on your fingernails, but get rid of that and that'll, that'll really help you out. So we are going to start with the cylinder beads. I've decided today we're going to do a size 14 millimeter here. So we need that size. And we're going to start with cylinder beads. Now to determine the number for this, I've put a little, uh, a little PDF that in the show notes there that you can see and you can download that and it has a great little chart in it so um, if you are you know looking for the number you can do that the other thing you can do and here's a little here's a little math lesson very quickly for a round stone that you're bezeling with size 11 cylinder beads so it only applies to a round stone and a bezel that started off with cylinder beads if you take the millimeter diameter across and you times it by 2.5, 2.5 is our magic number, that'll give you a number. So if, if we do it with this one, this is a 14 millimeter times 2.5, you'll get 35 as your number. Now if that number is odd, as it is in this case, you just wanna round it up one, so I'd bring it up to 36. So millimeter diameter times 2.5, take that number, if it's odd, add one, and that'll give you the surround for it. You can tweak that number a little bit. Sometimes mathematically it works better to have different numbers. For example, 32 is a great number. Um, 36 is a good number too. Um, it just sort of depends what they're what you're doing with it and what they're divisible by. But you can usually tweak it by a couple of you know a couple beads one way or the other. But that's a great starting point. So as we said, we're going to do 36. So I'm going to thread out my 36 beads. Okay, so there we go. That is our 36 beads you got on there. I highly recommend counting and counting again because it's very easy to get this number wrong and if it's wrong, it's not gonna work very well for you. So 36 beads on there. Leave yourself about a six inch tail because you need to be able to weave that off, get a needle on that later and weave that off. And we're gonna just tie a knot. Um, it's a square knot, so right over left, left over right. But I'm gonna show you a little trick if you're working with fire line. Um, with nylon thread, this doesn't work so well because it will seize up, but I'm going to tie the first half of my knot and then I'm going to tie the second half of my knot. So right over left, left over right. Tighten it down. 
but tighten it down up high rather than pulling it down to the base. And then you can pull, it's a little brute force to pull it down. But what that does is it prevents a bead from getting caught in the middle of that knot. So that's a good little trick if you're working with fire line. You can also, if you prefer, just go through the beads a second time and that'll give you a circle. But I like this approach because you can kind of loosen it up a little bit. And it's nice to have, you know, a bead, a couple beads width really of thread showing because when you work with peyote stitch, it's actually gonna suck that up. And you'll find it gets really tight. If you start out with a very tight circle, it'll get really tight as you work, um, and perhaps tighter than you like. So we will go through a couple of beads, just so that we're starting off working out of a bead as opposed to off a knot. That really helps. And we are gonna start our peyote stitch. So peyote stitch is gonna be pick up a cylinder, skip the next one, and go through the one after that. So let's pull that in place. So pick up a bead, skip a bead, go through a bead, just like that, all the way around. I want to keep going all the way around with that. Pick up a bead, skip a bead, go through a bead. That's your little mantra. Pick up a bead, skip a bead, there we go, you can see what that looks like there. Okay, so I've gotten all the way around. I'm up to my last stitch in this row, and I wanted to show you this, because this is even count tubular peyote stitch. So when you're doing even count tubular, you're gonna have a step up at the end of every round, and this step up is important. And what it entails is you're still gonna pick up your bead, and you're still gonna go through your bead like we've been doing. I'm just gonna pull this down so we have that there. So we're gonna pick up our bead. Here we go. Gonna skip our bead, and then we wanna go through the next bead, and then the step up is going through one more bead. And you can see I'm, do I'm passing through one more bead to come to the inside of the circle there. So pick up your bead, skip a bead as normal, go through a bead, and then step up to the inside of the circle and there we go pull it into place looks good there okay so there we go we're there now what we're going to do is we're going to switch over to the smaller 15 round Japanese seed beads because we're trying to pull this in to create sort of a cup that's going to hold our stone so let me do that now I'm going to switch over to the 15 rounds. And I'm gonna do the same thing, peyote stitch a row here. So I'm gonna pick up my bead. The bead I'm skipping is this low bead. And then the bead I'm going through is this high bead. So after the initial row of peyote stitch, it gets to be easier to see because you can actually see these little spots where you're supposed to be filling in with a bead. So put your little bead in there between every high bead. And you can see I'm kind of pulling in as I do it because I want this to come in. Like I said, we're trying to make a cup here that's gonna hold the stone. So I'm gonna continue all the way around and I will be right back. Okay, here we go. Right now, I'm at the end of the round. I got one more bead to put in. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put my little bead in and then again, we have that step up that we were talking about earlier. You're gonna have that at the end of every round. So we're gonna step up there there we go, looks good. Now, the last round we're gonna do here, because we're just gonna do one round of the 15 seed beads, and I know that because I've done these once or twice before, and um, that will vary depending on the size of your stone. So if you're using a bigger stone, it might be more than one row, but in this case, I know for a fact that we're gonna do one row here, and then we're gonna switch over to the Czech Charlottes. So these guys are even smaller, and what you're gonna find is they're just gonna continue that process of pulling this in a little bit, which is really nice. Um, they're a great, uh, they're a great finish too. They look, you know, because they're a Charlotte, they have a single facet on them, and uh, they kind of have a look of a of an antique bead. That's why I really enjoy working with them. They're beautiful little beads. So I'm gonna do one more round here with Czech Charlottes, and then we'll talk about what's gonna happen uh, once you put the stone in there. Okay, here we go. All done with those Czech Charlottes. Looking good. That means the back side of the bezel is done, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of work on the front side, so the stone's gonna go in like that. Um, 
what I need to do first here is I need to get my thread over to the other side to be working the other side. And I'm going to show you a little trick here that you might find useful when you do this. Generally, people like to work either, depending on, on your preference, some people like to work counterclockwise, uh, more often than not, right-handed people work counterclockwise, and then some people like to work clockwise. And again, that tends to be left-handed people, but that's not always the case. Um, but people tend to work in one direction or another. And you'll probably discover here I'm working counterclockwise there. So you can see my threads kind of coming out in that direction. Now, if I were just to pass through the beads to come over to this side and bead, it would end up being the opposite direction. So if I were to do that, if I were to come right through to here, then I would be working clockwise. And sometimes that's not comfortable for people. So a little tip I can give you here is when you're working your way to the other side, you can see I'm coming out of this 15 here, finish my row, go through the bead that's right next to it, or below it, I guess if you're looking at it the way I am, and change direction. So you're coming out one way, go through the bead above it the other way, and then up to the outer edge there. And what's gonna happen is if you have a look here, you can see now I'm, I'm back, I'll move the tail under so you can see that a little better, but now I am back to working counterclockwise, which is what I like. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna put the stone in like this. You may find it's easiest to do a row of the 15 rounds first before you really pop that in there because obviously you can see it pop right out at this point. But what you're gonna do is you're gonna switch right to the 15 rounds. You don't need to do any more of the cylinder beads and we're gonna peyote stitch around just like we did on the other side. And as you do this, it's kind of important here to pull in. Can you see how I'm sort of pulling in and up there? Because we want this to cup up and over the front side. Um, that's, you know, that's what's gonna hold it in place. So I'm gonna just peyote stitch all the way around, adding a bead between every high bead. Again, there will be a step up at the end of the round. So I will come back in a moment when we are at that point. Okay, here we have our row complete. And you can see it's really cupped up, so it's a great time to take your stone and put your stone in here. So let me set my stone in. You can see it fits nicely in. Um, I like doing it this side up, so right side up. Um, you could do it either way. Sometimes people do it this way. But my preference is this way, and I'll tell you why. There's a couple reasons. One is that whatever side you're looking at when you work, you're gonna be tidier. So if you're looking at this side, you know, you can kind of adjust if it's pulling over a little bit too much on one side, you can pull it back a little bit. Um, when it's upside down, you can't see that. So when it's right way around, you have a little bit more control there. The other thing is, when it's upside down like this, when you're passing through your beads, it's more likely that you might nick this enamel backing on your Rivoli. So that's avoided when it's this side up. And this is, um, you know, this won't be nicked the way the back backside would be. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do my little step up here. And you can see it's kind of too soon, really, to put the Charlottes in. We sort of, we need a little bit more. So I'm going to do one more round of these Japanese 15-0 seed beads, the round seed beads. And again, even more so, with each one I put in there. I really want to pull it up and over because we're trying to capture the stone in there nice and tight. So I'm going to bring up here and snuggle it into place. And you can use the same color or I chose to use a different color. That'd be fun to switch it up um, as you wish. But I'm going to go ahead and peyote this round and I will be back after that. Okay, at this point we finished that second row of 15 0 round Japanese seed beads. You can see it's looking good here. Now, at this point, I'm gonna switch over to my Czech Charlottes. And I'm gonna peyote stitch with those. But if you feel like it's too soon to be using those, you certainly can do another round uh, with the 15 Japanese seed beads. I have given you a chart in the PDF that's downloadable. Um, you'll see it down in the show notes. That will kind of give you guidelines, but feel free to adapt this depending on your own tension. People's tension is different, so you may need to adjust the row numbers. You know, it's a it's a play it by ear thing, but you don't really want to see a lot of thread showing. So if at this point, if you put in the Charlottes and you're like, oh, yikes, there's a lot of thread showing, um, take those out and go back and do another round of the 15 Japanese beads there. And what you're going to do, same thing, 
kind of peyote stitch with your check charlottes. Again, pulling in with each one as you do it. And that just adds a really nice finish to your, to your bezel there. Having those little guys makes all the difference. They are wonderful and beautiful beads. So I'm gonna finish this up, be back momentarily. All right, now we are all done with that final row. That's the Czech Charlottes. Looks fantastic, came out nice there. Like the colors too. And the last thing is gonna be to weave off your threads. Now you may wanna leave your threads on here cause you may be planning to do something else and attaching it to other things, um, incorporating it into other uh, projects. So um, so for, for that, in that case, you may want to leave your tail on, but let me show you how to weave it off. And regardless, you're going to want to at least get one knot in here, um, even if you're leaving your threads on, because you don't want it to loosen up, which it can do if you don't do that. So I recommend half hitching, and half hitching just entails going underneath the thread with the needle, and we're going to make a little loop there, and we're just going to pass through the loop and we're gonna pull that knot down. Now you just wanna make sure when you pull it down that it's sitting between the beads and it's not over a bead. So you wanna do that. Then you're gonna pass through a couple beads. If you're truly weaving off and getting rid of the thread, I recommend doing that probably two or three times. Makes me feel better to have it a couple of times there. Um, and that will sort of hold everything secure for you. And then you can comfortably weave off that tail through a few more beads and then you can just cut it. That that will finish off your stone. Um, can be incorporated into all kinds of great designs. Um, there's uh, all sorts of uh, all sorts of uh, applications for this. Like I said, you can also use it on any round stone if you have a cabochon, you know, and it's round. You can use the same technique. You just want to do your calculations. That math equation we talked about, millimeter diameter times 2.5. If it's odd, you round it up, and um, that'll give you a really cool, really cool bezeled stone. You can, if you like and some people like to do this, you can either do it before or you can do it after you've bezeled it, but some people like to put a little nail polish on the back side of the stone to kind of protect it from contact with the skin. Skin can, you know, skin chemistry, depending on the person too, it varies person to person, but skin chemistry can kind of affect the enamel or the coating on the back side. Um, the only exception I'm gonna tell you, because I've, I've made this mistake, is if you're working with an ultra rivoli, there's, there's ones that are called ultra, and those ones have a backing that will peel off if you use a clear nail polish on it. So stay away from the clear nail polish on the ultra ones, but other than that, I haven't had problems, and you can just, you know, apply it either after you've bezeled it or um, before you've bezeled it or with my own samples I frequently do will do it along the line um, as you know as needed because there's a lot of wear on my samples very handled but that is also an option if you like um, and then you would also weave off your tail in the same fashion that we talked about weaving off your working thread where you're going to half hitch a couple of times um, and you will have your cool little rivoli. Now, like I mentioned um, in the intro here, I did write a book, um, Creating Crystal Jewelry with, with Swarovski, which has loads of applications for this. So if you're looking for projects, um, there's a bunch in there that you can access um, and it will give you sort of an opportunity to try this out and then make it into something. Okay, there's our little friend all bezeled and with the tails woven off. Um, I thought I'd also take a minute just to show you a couple of uh, the applications for, um, for this bezeling technique. So here's a necklace that I've done. It's called a Vineyard Jewel. Um, put it in there so you can really see the rivoli part of it. Um, but these are bezeled rivolis down here and then they're incorporated into a larger necklace with embellishments and herringbone and all of that. Um, but that's what these are here. These are also the ultra ones that I mentioned. So you can see the backing on that. Can you see that? Um, those are the ones that you want to try to avoid putting the nail polish on. So keep that in mind. And then here is another example. It's a bracelet I made with bezeled rivlies too. This is called the spring fling bracelet. Um, and it 
has several of them in it that have been bezeled and then linked together. Um, so for that sort of thing, you would definitely be adding, you know, leaving your tails on it um, so that you could link them. But that's just a couple of the applications out there for the bezeled stones. Thanks for joining me today for Bezeling Rivalies. Be well, stay safe, and beat on. Mm -hmm.